Shabbat Shalom. Wow, what an encouragement. Thank you, Chris and team. And um, that new song that he taught us about generations, when he started with it, my wife and I, we had a little uh, glance at each other because I'm going to talk about generations today. So, thank you. That was just amazing. And, and divine, I, I believe that Father leads us on his miraculous path and his wonderful path on our journey of faith. And isn't it fabulous to stand here in the year 2023 and to read about Abram's story that happened in the year 2023? I mean, you can't make this up, can you? Talking about things in the year 2023 about what happened in the year 2023. I mean, it's like crazy. It's like, it's not, I mean, you can't even write a, a science fiction better than that. So, um, our journey of faith effectively started in this Torah portion that we're going to study and discuss today. And it started in that year of 2023 with when our father Abram had to rescue Lot. And, and it entailed a war, and a war that, where there, was, there were hostages involved. And he had to rescue the hostages. Does that sound somehow familiar? Of things that's happening in the year 2023? Sort of a few years apart, but like crazy? And this journey of faith is an unknown journey. It's a roller coaster. Because if it was not a roller coaster, it would not, not, not have required faith. So it is a roller coaster because it requires faith in one who is eternally true. So. We start with a, a Father Abram's roller coaster. And if it was a roller coaster for him, what will it be for us? A roller coaster. If it was unsure for him, vague for him when he started his journey, it will be vague for us. But when we look back, we will say, Wow, Baruch Hashem, what a mighty God we serve. So we read, and Jehovah said to Abram, go yourself out of your land from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I show you. And I shall make you a great nation and bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I shall bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. And in you all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram left as Jehovah had commanded him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. 2023. So, what do we see there? There's a call, there's a purpose, and there's a responsibility. The call is Father's job. The purpose is his description. The responsibility is that of Abraham. Do you think that has changed? That has not changed. There's a call from our father with a very specific purpose, but then that's touched or linked to a responsibility. And we continue reading. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the beings whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land Canaan. And they came to the land of Canaan, and Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And Jehovah appeared to Abram and said, to your seed I give this land, and he built there an altar to Jehovah who had 
appeared to him. The responsibility continues. He walks. Where is he going? He goes to the land and then he does something. He builds an altar and he worships the Father. And so we see this picture uh, um, sort of unfolding in front of us. A call, a purpose, a responsibility around a specific place linked to worship. I can't help but think that we realize that all over the world where people are gathered together, reading the Torah and reading the Torah portion, they will be reading this today. How immense. Imagine. Where the rivers of the Garden of Eden, those four rivers, Genesis 2, has spread across the world, (coughs) touching every place where there are a lot of trees of righteousness, people who are together today, sitting at those rivers, receiving the nourishment from those rivers, they will be reading these words. And they will be united, as we are today, united, realizing a responsibility, a locality, but the thing that sort of captures it, that tops it off, is worship. So, in our journey of faith, there could be many crossroads, many small roads that we can also take, little detours that we can take. And we obviously do take them. And we can occasionally go wrong. Take the when you're a male, you don't listen to your wife and you take the wrong road because you know where you must go. And then you're on the wrong road. Well, I've told you, you're on the wrong road. Um, just, just ask the map or look at the map or whatever the case may be, but you're on the wrong road. No, I'm not lost. I'm just sort of meandering and exploring. <laughs> but, but on our journey of faith, we're also exploring. But the key thing here is worship. And as Karen, Karen has prayed, there's only one peace. It's the peace in Messiah Yeshua. When we worship Him and we bow our knees before Him. Speaking of detours, I'm going to go on a slight detour quickly to read from the book of Jubilees the parallel part of what we've just read in the book of Genesis. The book of uh, Jubilees is in the Apocrypha. It sort of runs parallel as a description, but it's obviously not of the same stature as the scripture itself. But in the book of Jubilees, the parallel part reads this. Abram sat up throughout the middle of the night on the new moon, On the seventh night, um, seventh month. What is that called? So he observed the feasts. So at Yom Teruah of that year, to observe the stars from the evening to the morning in order to see what would be the character of the year with regard to the rains, and he was alone as he sat and observed. And a word came into his heart and he said, All the signs of the stars and the signs of the moon and the sun are in the hand of the Lord. Why do I search them out? If he desires, he caused it to rain, morning and evening. And if he desired it, he withholds it and all the things are in his hand. And he prayed that, uh, that night and said, My God, God most high, Thou alone art my God, and thee and thy dominion I have chosen. And thou hast created all things, and all things that are are the work of thy hands. Deliver me from the hands of evil spirits who have sway over at the thoughts of men's hearts, 
and let them not lead me astray from thee, my God, and establish thou me and my seed forever, that we go not astray from henceforth and forevermore. And he said, Shall I return unto Ur of the Chaldeans, who seek my face, that I may return to them? Or am I to remain here in this place? The right path before thee prosper it in the hands of thy servant, that he may fulfill it, and that I may not walk in the deceitfulness of my heart, O my God. That was his prayer. And then, what follows in the book of Jubilees is what we've read in the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis starts there. Get up thee up from the country and from thy kindred and go out. That's where the book of Genesis starts. But before that, he was in prayer. He was in worship. At the feast of our father, at the appointed time of our father, at the start of the new year, he, he looked and he asked the Father for guidance on his life. And he prayed, he said, I'm not going to look at the stars for what is going to happen with the rains because I know you are the giver of the rains. My life is in your hands. My whole being belongs to, me, to you. And then he prayed that last line there, and establish thou me and my seed forever, that we go not astray from henceforth and forevermore. And he was praying for his children, and he hasn't even had a one yet. Wow. The rest is history. The rest is when our Father responded to this prayer. If we think about it in terms of this context, then Genesis 12, 1, and the calling of Abram didn't just happen. I mean, Abram was not just walking, and then all of a sudden, he heard the father say to him, go to the land of Canaan. No, he was in worship. He was praying to his father, and he was praying for his generations to come, that they will not go astray. And now we understand the blessing that our Father has bestowed on him even more. Because get up from their country and from those kindred and go and whoever blesses you will be blessed and whoever curses you will be cursed. And I shall be a God to thee and thy son and to thy son's son and to all thy seed. Fear not for from henceforth and unto all generations of the earth, I am thy God. So his journey of faith started in prayer, asking the Father for direction. Then the call, the purpose, go to the land. Then the responsibility. He picked it up, he picked it up and he went. And on the other side, when he entered the land, what did he do? He built an altar and he worshipped again. And he thanked the Father for it. And now we've got the bookends. It started with prayer and worship. Our Father answered him and it concluded when he entered into the land with an altar and prayer, worshipping the Father. And the whole thing is sort of embedded in that worship. So Abram's journey of faith is a journey of worship. And he prayed it for his seed and for the generations. If it was his journey and the template and a picture of his journey, then what is it for us? It's one for us as well. It's the same. What is true for him is true for us. So it starts, the Torah portion has got the name Laka Laka. Laka Laka. It's Laka Laka. On the beach. Laka Laka. We walk. Go yourself out. And it's derived from Chalach, which means walk. But it actually then means walk, walk. 
because it's a lamet kaf shafit, lamet kaf shafit. It's just the, the consonants that changes. So, it's as far as I could find, the only occurrence that this specific construct appears in scripture. We have walk, walk. Go walk, walk, Abraham. And so, there's a lot of drashim, um, commentaries around why this repeat, walk, walk. But basically what it boils down to is the fact that there's both a physical and a spiritual dimension in this walk. And the spiritual dimension and the physical dimension is a chat. You walk where the spirit of the Father leads. Where the spirit of the Father leads, that's where you walk. The two are connected. So, Abraham, I'm giving you a call, I'm giving you a purpose, uh, with a responsibility, go walk, walk. Go live and f speak into the spiritual reality, but you speak into the spiritual reality by doing it physically. And by doing it physically, it's going to manifest spiritually, the two dovetails. And so, his journey of faith, his journey of worship, is a walk-walk journey. It's an action linked to a spiritual reality. Again, how relevant is that for us today? We have to, what we do with our lives, and the spiritual call and the reality of our lives and, and the Spirit of God in our lives, they're intertwined. You cannot, there can be no disconnect between the call, the Spirit's action and work through us, and what we do physically with our lives. I find this very fascinating if we think in terms of this debate out there in terms of grace versus works. It's a nonsensical debate. Totally nonsensical debate. Because it's a walk-walk debate. They're integrated. You walk where the Spirit leads. Where the Spirit leads, there you walk. They're together. They're echad. So, from a physical perspective, we all understand it. But from a spiritual, metaphorical perspective, we find the word all over the Scripture. Where, for he walked in the former ways of his father David. Obviously, that's not physical. That's mental, spiritual walk. And you must walk in the ways of our father in Deuteronomy. It's a spiritual, mental walk with the Father. So where we walk physically, executing the task, executing the call on our lives, so tightly connected with the spiritual call. And the worship of Abraham is this walk-walk life. He walked, walked physically where he was called to go spiritually. And out of that came this massive reality which is the, the great nation, the purpose that's then revealed. So Abraham's physical walk is a picture of his walk with the father, and where he physically walked reflects the father's walk with him. And it's also Ab Abraham's calling, which is his purpose of life, and his responsibility. And his responsibility of walking according to the calling includes an action. And as I was preparing, I also realized that today comes before tomorrow. Now, that's not such a big, great revelation, I'm sure. <laughs> but tomorrow, Andres told us what's going to happen tomorrow here. And, and I couldn't but miss the connection. And what Andres has shared earlier this morning in terms of the purpose of tomorrow it speaks right into this. You understand the weightiness thereof. It's about the calling that's on our lives as a, as a fellowship and as individuals. Who are we and where are we to walk? Because it, 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 it links in with the responsibility. The one word out of, this, out of this whole thing from Abraham is this word responsibility. It's one thing to receive a call from the Father Father, speak to me. What must I do? 
And if he does, to, to let it slip. What must I do for you? I'll do everything and anything. And then he tells you, and you let it slip. Abram didn't let it slip. He followed up on his calling, on his purpose. But it was revealed progressively over time. And I think he was very grateful of, to that as well, that it was revealed progressively over time and not just shown to him up front the entire story in terms of what will happen in the year 2023 on the other side of Messiah. But that is now our responsibility because it's a generational thing. We have to pick that up. The purpose of having a great nation never changed the revelation thereof grew over time till today. But now we are picking up that responsibility. And not just us, everybody around the world that's been touched by his word, by his spirit, and by his mercy and his grace. But yeah, life is not straightforward. Abram experienced that. We are experiencing it. And because it is a roller coaster, we need faith even more. And trust the one who spoke to Abraham. And trust the one who spoke to us. And live accordingly. So, what I've done here is to provide us with a picture of this Torah portion. Abraham's walk walk. It started in verses 12 verse 1 with his call. Then the purpose in two verses, verse 2 verse, uh, two verse 16. And then the responsibility, his walk and his worship. Straight after that, what happened? This famine. How many times have we experienced that? You realize that you have to do something and you're excited and you start out with something just to be hit by famine. What do you do? What did Abram did, do? He went to Egypt. What did they do in Egypt? No, my wife is so beautiful. She's no longer my wife. She's my sister. <laughs> like crazy. I've got this beautiful wife, but she's my sister. <laughs> the humanness of Abraham, I appreciate in this because how many times have we done that? So when we are in famine, where do we go for our solutions? Do we go to Egypt? Make our own plans. Lie, deceit. But in and through that, the Father's hand was on him. And he returned to the land. What followed after his return to the land? The very next section absolute incredible prosperity he grew so rich so affluent and everybody in his household that what happened what was the consequence thereof a family feud trouble between him and Lot and the, uh, and the laborers and the workmen of, of him and Lot and following the family feud, verses uh, chapter 13, 6 to 18, what happened thereafter? A war. What happened after the war? A family reunion. And after the family reunion, Melchizedek appeared to him. And in, chapters, uh, in chapter 14, 17 to 24. And after Melchizedek? He was given the covenant. Came face to face with the Messiah and then been given the, the covenant. I mean, that's, that's the pinnacle. I mean, higher than that, the screen doesn't go. That's where it is. Chapter 15. What follows after chapter 15? Lower than that. Made his own, own plans. A Hager solution. To his problem. How many Hagar solutions have we made in our lives? But despite the Hagar solution that he attempted, 
despite that, our Father's presence was still with him. Chapter 17, the promise of Isaac. And that's the Torah portion. His roller coaster. Hyper, high points. He walked and he worshipped the Father in the land. Low points. The spiritual famine. Physical famine that then led to spiritual famine into Egypt, into exile. But then he realized he must go back to the land, back to his calling. Back to his calling, what happened? Father prospered him. But then all mayhem broke loose. Internally, a family feud, followed by a war with external parties. But out of that, the appearance of our Messiah to him and the blessing that emanated from that. Filled with a covenant. But then, many years passed and he said, okay, what must I do? And the consequences are still with us today. But the promise of Isaac. So this incredible walk is also our walk. Because if it's that of our father, it will be our walk as well. Going through all these different things. Why? What then shall we say, Avram our father to have found according to the flesh? For if Avram was declared right by works, he has ground for boasting, but not before Elohim. For what does the scripture say? Avram believed Elohim, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. The more roller coastery our lives are becoming, if such a word exists, the more we are in this low roller coaster of life, the more we should believe our Father, not less. The more the turmoil is in the world, the more we should believe. And the more we should pray that others will follow him and follow after him. So, this is also our picture. You can put in your specific events in your life into this. High points, low points. Solutions that you and I may have made for such specific situations that actually caused grave consequences. There are very few households that would not have gone through some or other sp uh, spiritual famine situation. That would not feel in exile at one point in time or another. Very few households that has not gone through a family feud of some kind. Feel that you're in constant war. The question is, we must not get entangled in that detail so much and lose sight of the perspective. The moment that we can turn our eyes out of that specific detail and see the picture and say, but this is the path of our Father with me. Where am I going? I'm a child of the Father. I'm in the covenant. We can keep a picture on the end goal. And trust him for his guidance going forward. And for that, I believe we have to realize that our walk includes the generational blessings. We so much, I think most of us know and have spoken about generational curses over many years. Freemasonry, Bruderbond, and all sorts of bad goeders that has happened in our bloodlines before us. That we must also remember that blessings are carried forth from Abraham, which are generational blessings. And what are those? And those generational blessings are tied up with our call and our purpose in our lives going forward. Because they linked into Abraham's blessing. Why? Because 
Those who hate me will have a curse for seven or eight generations, but those who love me will have for thousands of generations. And we are still within the thousands of generations from Abraham. For myself, my forefather was a French Higuenay. He was a religious refugee. He had to run for his life. They were killing all his family members. He came out by himself to the day, 300 years, in 1723. As a religious refugee, he came. He was a schoolmaster, a teacher, a homeschooler. And that's I. 300 years. It has not changed. His resume is my resume. Can you make this up? It's not possible. So we have to think of generational blessings as well when we think in terms of our callings so that's on our lives. Your yeah, bad goodness has happened. We have gone funny places. And we have to repaint that. Absolutely cut that off and stop that nonsense. And but because of the blessing on Abraham and because of faith, there's this massive blessing as well. I'm just highlighting mine because I don't know yours, but for each one of us, there are pillars of faith who stood before us and their walk, their walk, walk. Their physical walk, spiritual walk, and ours are linked. But so are our children, and the children after them. The walk, walk is linked. So our Father has given us a baton that's running from 2023 with Abraham up until today. From generation to generation to generation to generation to be a blessing to build the family. And for the one he's given this, for the other one he's given that. But it lies deep. The question is, do we take it up, the responsibility to do that? So, is there a guide for our walk, walk? The spiritual walk, physical walk. And there might be many guides in scripture for this walk, walk. But as I was preparing, I was impressed to, to discuss and to talk about the, what is called the Beatitudes, the opening of our Master's first sermon. So if it was good enough for him to be the opening part of his first sermon on earth, then it's pretty good for us as a guide to our walk, walk. Blessed are the poor or the humble in spirit because this is the kingdom, the, uh, the reign of the, given, uh, the kingdom of heaven, sorry, the kingdom of heaven, the reign of the heavens. Which means that it's possible not to be poor in spirit, to be arrogant, haughty, which means that the reign of the kingdom might not be yours. It implies that we will be engaged and see and meet people who will not be poor and humble in spirit, but we will have to offer them and treat them and work with them and engage with them being humble in spirit before the Father. Blessed are those who mourn, those who weep and who grieve, because they shall be comforted. That huge word comfort that we spoke about two weeks ago, contronym, that means in the pain, you will also have comfort. There will be comfort in the pain. It means that you and I will be engaged with and we will experience weeping, but we will be comforted. But when we are seeing people that are mourning, can we offer them comfort? Blessed are the meek, the gentle, because they shall inherit the earth. It means there are people that are not gentle. That's brutal. They will not inherit the earth. And when we are engaged and when we do see them and when we are in the situations where we are exposed to that, how do we respond? 
can we respond in meekness, but in truth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they shall be filled. So it's possible to be so full of self that you do not hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, then, you're going to be, then you're not going to be filled. But if we are hungry for the truth, for righteousness, then we will be filled to help us this walk, walk in righteousness before the Father. Blessed are the compassionate, the merciful, because they shall obtain compassion. So, there will be times that you will need compassion and will receive it. But if we are then in situations where people are in need of compassion, can we extend that to them in our walk, walk with the Father? Blessed are the clean or the pure or innocent in heart, because they shall see Elohim. Father, show us your face. There are many songs written about that. Be with us. Clean, pure, innocent in heart. We'll see Elohim through his scripture, through his word, through his presence, through his, 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 his spirit that is revealed. Blessed are the peacemakers, which means that there will be situations where there's absence of peace. Because they shall be called sons of Elohim. Warmongers will have trouble. Blessed are those persecuted for righteousness sake, because theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. Which is the same result as being poor or humble in spirit. The reign of the kingdom. Do you think that's linked? Do you think we will grow in our humbleness in spirit before the Father because and through the persecution? Yes. Through persecution, through the refiner's fire, we will grow in our humble walk before the Father. So when we do go through the persecution for righteousness sake, what are we to do? Complain? Ach, no, Father, please not me. Or thank him for grooming us to become poor in spirit before him and live in such a life before him. Blessed are you when they reproach and persecute you and falsely say every wicked word against you for my sake. Rejoice and be glad because your reward in heaven is great for in this way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So which means that they will persecute and falsely say every wicked word against you. There will be fake news against you. And they will persecute you because of fake news. But rejoice in that. And so, these beatitudes, these blessings, actually provides us with a very practical guide for our walk, walk with the Father. And with this, our Messiah Yeshua kicked off his entire ministry with these words. And so, Father, we can basically pray this and say, Father, help us to be humble in spirit. Help us to be able to provide comfort to those who mourn especially in a time of war. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to be pure and clean in heart. Help us to be compassionate while we're hungry, while we're first, first for your righteousness. Please reveal it to us. And so you can take these beatitudes and make it a prayer and a walk of life before the Father. But there's much inspiration from the Haftarah. The Haftarah is the portion that runs in the, in the prophets that sort of dovetails with the Torah portion. And I'm going to read a section out of the Haftarah that provides us with incredible inspiration for enabling us to walk such a walk of life before the Father. Why do you say, O oh yes, Yaakov, and speak, O oh Israel, my way is hidden from Jehovah and my rights um, are overlooked by my Father? So why are you saying the Father is not near you? Why do you say you don't see him? Why do you think he's far away from you, that your prayer is hitting the ceilings? Did you not know, have you not heard, 
the everlasting Elohim Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Just that line, accepting that and making that our own, is a step of faith. Because if you can't do that, then you don't have the faith in the Father. But if you say, yes, I have heard and I do know that the everlasting Elohim, Yodai Vafai, is the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint, he's not weary, his understanding is unsearchable. He knows where we are. And he knows the future. And he will be with us going forward. That's the inspiration we can then get for this walk, walk. He gives power to the faint and to those who have no might, he increases strength. In this roller coaster, he's the one that provides the strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait on Yodai Vafai renew their strength. They rise up in the, up the wing like eagles, and they run and are not weary. They chalach, they walk, and do not faint. They can have the strength to do the walk, walk, like Abram walked, walked the physical and the spiritual together because he will help us. He will give us power, uh, strength for that. Be silent before me. Don't argue. Be silent before him. You, you coastlands, and let peoples renew their power. Let them come near. Let them speak. Let us come together for right ruling. I, Yodai Vafai, am the first and, and with and, and the last is, uh, I am. Coastlands see it and fear. The ends of the earth are afraid. They draw near and come. And they will come to him for his peace, for his mercy, for his grace, for his counsel. So, what do we see from this? O oh, Jacob, Israel, there is a calling on your life. Do not tire. Do not be despondent. Yes, fallen you and I might have. But your walk and my walk is his walk. That's what it is saying. And we can proceed with faith. We continue. But you, Israel, are my servant, Yaakov, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. If Abraham was his friend whom he has chosen, and you are descendants of Abraham, what does that make you and I? Friends. Abraham, my friend, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest place and said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and have not rejected you. What is he doing with his friends? He's not rejecting us either. In this roller coaster, realize that he has chosen us, he's chosen you, and he will not reject you, he will be with you. Do not fear. For I am with you. Do not look around. For I am Yodai Vafa Elohim. I shall strengthen you. I shall also help you. I shall also uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. See all those who raged against you. Like seriously? See all those who raged against you are ashamed and blush. They are as non-existent. And the men who strive with you perish. This is being read all over the world today. You think this is necessary? You seek them, but you do not find them, those who struggle with you. Those who fight you are as non-existent as naught. And the same concept there is like the kingdom of Egypt. The same naught, the same words are being used. As naught as the kingdom of Egypt, as far away is naught. For I, Elohim, Yorevafi, your Elohim, am holding your right hand saying to you, do not fear, I shall help you. Do not fear, you worm Yaakov, you men of Israel, I shall help you, declares Jehovah, and your Redeemer, the set apart one of Israel. Amen. That's the Haftarah for this week. That takes it to a completely new level. There's the walk walk of Abraham, but then there's the walk walk of the people, his descendants, who will go through strife, who will go through struggles, 
who will go through the roller coaster of life. Do not fear. O Jacob in Israel, children of Abraham, you are called. Do not fear. Your enemies will perish. Do not fear. Have faith. And so we can proceed in rather uncertain times with this as a, as a roadmap. Yes, the roller coaster ride, the Big Dipper might even get worse and more scary. But either we can look at the Big Dipper and say, I can't make it. Or I can look at the Father who holds it in, our, in his hand. And so, let's look at Abram's journey as a prophetic picture. If he's our father, which he is, and we're his descendants, that picture that I've shown of Leke Leke, Leke Lecha, that provides us with a picture of his life, could that also be a prophetic picture? As I was preparing, I thought, let's check how this is going to link up with the one book where it's a go-to book in Scripture if you want to know anything about prophecy. And it's the book Ezekiel. How does that link up with the book Ezekiel? It started with the call of Ezekiel. It then talked about the purpose of Ezekiel as the watchman. It then is about the walk, walk and worship of Israel, of following especially idols in chapters 4 to 15. And then speaks about the spiritual famine in Israel, chapters 16 to 24. But then it speaks about the nations and the condemnation over the nations and the wrath over the nations in chapters 25 to 32. But then there's the promise of the return to the land in chapters 32, uh, 33 to 34. And absolutely incredible chapters about the promise to return to the land. It then jumps. It then gives us the section around the covenant of peace, but the judgment on Mount Seir and Hagar, and an incredible promise of Isaac in chapter 36. It then goes back and talks about prosperity. You will be like dry bones, but in the valley, but I will put together the flesh and you will prosper. But remember, the family is going to be divided. The prophecy around the two sticks. But I will put it together. It then talks about the war. Gog Magog war. But then out of that, a family reunion. And out of that, Messiah. It is identical. It is absolutely identical in its structure and in its theme and in its uh, meaning. Abram's walk was his walk-walk. It was also a prophetic walk, as we can see through the book of Ezekiel. If this is true, the question is, can we see it at a different place? We do know that our Father, in his great kindness and in his great wisdom and in his infinite wisdom has selected a people to be his people on earth. Can it be represented by the people of Judah? There's Yeshua who came and he called them and gave the people, the house of Judah, a purpose to take the gospel to all nations. And there were people like Saul, Kepha, Yochanan, that went to all the world in a movement that was called the way. And they walked the walk and they worshipped our Father. But then a period of spiritual famine and they were dispersed into the nations, among others, Germany. They returned to the land and they prospered. An incredible prosperity. And heard of prosperity. If you think in terms of the period that they've been back in the land. Family feud. 
unheard of family feud. I have to take a detour here to talk about what is called the curse of the eighth decade. It has been written, much has been written about it by commentators. Only three times in history of the world, Judah has been reigned by a king from Jerusalem. The first was King David and Solomon, and the second one was Hismonian, and the third one is currently. It's the only time that the house of Judah was reigned by themselves from, Judah, from Jerusalem. The first two did not last eight decades. They perished in the eighth decade. And when this family feud happened, they asked, is that the curse of the eighth decade? That the current family feud, because of the judicial reform, will rip Israel apart. Because it's in the eighth decade. And it had all the ingredients of ripping it apart. And be a fulfillment of that curse of the eighth decade. But then, war. Out of war, what we pray for. Out of that, Messiah. The covenant of peace, which will deal with Hagar and the promise of our Messiah. And so the house of Judah is a picture of Lech Lecha, the walk of Abraham, who's going before us, which is a picture of the prophetic given to us through Ezekiel. As you are as indicated before, this war there that's in sort of purplish, all the purplish stuff, stuff that still needs to happen. This war is not a Gog Magog, Gog Magog, uh, Magog war that's currently happening. It's perhaps a precursor to it, but it's not a Gog Magog war of um, Ezekiel. There are other things that must happen. Other things that must happen like an anti-Messiah that must appear, like the abomination of desolation that must happen, which means that there must be an altar, which requires, incidentally, the utensils from the tabernacle, from the temple. So there are other things that must happen. But this one is definitely a precursor to that and might lead into, and probably will lead into those. But this helps us and guides us how we should pray and how to pray into it. Because what do we have, where do we have to pray into? The family reunion, the two sticks, and the family reunion with, the, with Messiah, Melchizedek. And the return and the peace covenant. And so Judah becomes a picture of the prophetic, walking the walk. And we, who are not in the land, We have to pick up our responsibility in this process as well, our call. I'm going to conclude with a prayer that I'm going to read from the book of Daniel. So this prayer of Daniel is, is the prayer with which I would like to conclude the service as well. So I watched a movie called the book of Daniel and an f- incredible movie and I would really encourage everybody to watch it and I was encouraged by the person Daniel and, and his stature I, I don't think many of us has been face to face with hungry lions before I don't think our friends were thrown into a burning furnace We did not stood up to uh, the most evil king in the world and most powerful king in the world, Nebuchadnezzar, and told him, okay, next year you're going to eat grass and still live after saying that. Incredible person, Daniel. But, But he prayed for the return of his people to the land. And this prayer that he prayed is highly relevant for us today. Because when we look at that, at this, that's where we are. That's our job. 
We have to pray for this family reunion, going back to the land with the Messiah appearing. And so Daniel prophesied about that a lot. And hence the importance, I think, believe of Daniel's prayer. I'd like to ask that everybody will stand while I read this and as a, as a prayer for us, and then Johan will conclude thereafter. O Jehovah, great and awesome El, guarding the covenant and the kindness to those who love him and to those who guard his commands. We have sinned and did crookedness and did wrong and rebelled to turn aside from your commands and from your right rulings. And we have not listened to your servant, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our sovereigns, our heads and our fathers, and to do all the and to all the people of the land. O Jehovah, to you is the righteousness and to us the shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Yehuda, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those near and those far off in all the lands to which you have driven them because of their trespass, which they have trespassed against you. O Master, to us is the shame of face, and to our sovereigns, and to our heads, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To Jehovah our Elohim are the compassion and the forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, and we have not obeyed the voice of our father, Jehovah our Elohim, to walk in his Torot, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. And all Israel have transgressed your Torah and turned aside so as not to obey your voice. So the curse and the oath written in the Torah of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, have been poured out on us, for we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who judged us, by bringing upon us great evil, for under all the heavens there has not been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the Torah of Moshe, all this evil has come upon us, and we have not entreated the face of Jehovah our Elohim to turn back from our crookedness and to study your truth. Hence Jehovah has watched over the evil and has brought it upon us. For Jehovah our Elohim is righteous in all the works which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Jehovah our Elohim, who brought, us, who brought your people out of the lands of Israel with a strong hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. O Jehovah, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your displeasure and your wrath be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your set-apart mountains, for because of our sins and because of our crookedness of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. And now, our Elohim, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the sake of Jehovah, cause your face to shine on your set-apart place, which is laid waste. O my Elohim, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our wastes and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great compassions. O Jehovah, hear. O Jehovah, forgive. O Jehovah, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my Elohim, for your city and your people are called by your name. Amen.